Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's time for another edition of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast, where I'm your host, Dr. Jim Hoven, and I have the most wonderful opportunity every week to talk to people who are making a difference, and they can make a difference all over the world or in their own backyard. Today, I have a guest who's making a difference in Arizona to start, and it's only getting bigger from there. My guest today is Heather Lay, and Heather is, I mean, her dossier is huge. She's a professional model, she has businesses, she's a consultant, she's a CEO of her own company, she's a rock star. So for her to take time out to visit with us, super, super impressive. You're gonna love her. Make sure if you like this that you share this with someone because what we're gonna talk about today isn't just your standard, ordinary, hey, how'd you climb the business ladder? It's rather tied to her story. And I'm not gonna spoil uh, her story at all because you are gonna love it. It's a story of overcoming and understanding yourself. So without any further ado, Heather, welcome to the show. Hello, and hello everybody watching. <laughs> hey Heather, um, you know, you and I were, were visiting off air and your energy is contagious. The things that you're doing are so impactful. And I want you to just tell just a little bit before we get into your personal story, just a little bit about you and what you're involved in right now because it is so many things and we're gonna focus on a couple really important initiatives that you're involved with. But just give the audience just a little introduction before we dive into your, what I'm gonna call your hero's journey because truly you are taking a hero's journey that's making a difference. Awesome. Well, for people who don't know me, um, my background in, in business is a couple things. I have a couple industries. I started modeling at 17 and I worked a lot here locally in the state of Arizona doing, you know, one off photo shoots um, and some nonprofit fashion shows to kind of build my book. And then eventually when I was 21, I went to Greece. That's sort of every model's dream. To it. And the goal is to go international once you have a portfolio built up to be able to do that, which I I did and um, I was there for about two and a half months and um, a lot of people know my story publicly as me being open about the fact that my model apartment in Greece was broken into for human trafficking. They were scoping out the location um, which kind of deterred me from it was embarrassing um, at the time to make the decision, but I chose to not move and go to Thailand or Spain. Those were the next trips because I just knew that at the level that I wanted to help people, it wouldn't help if I'm dead. So I just decided to, to change my path, which sort of brought me back to my love and my dream of marketing and advertising. And I loved watching this movie with, I think it was Mel Gibson called What Women Want. If you've ever seen that, it's sort of him being, have you seen it? I have, it's been a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was back in the day. That was, you know, you go find an advertising law firm and you go and that's, you work on all these projects by Nike and, and all of that and that's the dream. But obviously at this age that I was at, um, you know, that's when web design and hosting and all of this came to be before even social media. Um, I started actually in that hosting space around, I think I was 22, like I made a quick change and I just kind of hustled up. I started in their tech support team, troubleshooting servers and da databases. And then eventually when the web design, uh, the design consultant position technically opened up for their web design team who handled a lot of small businesses, I immediately interviewed and uh, the person who had been interviewing longer got it. But within a month, I was, I think, back over into that team. And that's actually where I, where I was for a good at least three and a half years. And I was doing modeling on the side. And then um, I just got really good and I created my own process and I streamlined that. And then I got notice from directors and eventually they had me go from a design consultant to a, a design lead where I managed 10 designers and kind of helped them to help with their consultation calls, what a good website design is, right? Like what, what is a high conversion website and all of that. Sorry, I just turned my phone on uh, mute. Um, and then eventually I ran the whole department. So I had 30 designers at this company called Endurance International Group. We owned Constant Contact, Bluehost, HostGator, Domain.com. They were, they acquired a lot of different uh, online brands that were mostly in the hosting space, but definitely in like the marketing sphere with all of that. 
And then I realized what actually made me really good at projects was because I was really good with people. And I had always known I loved um, helping people. So I left to go to try and be a psychologist, but it had been like um, about eight years since I'd been back to school and I hate math. And so then all of a sudden I'm here now, I got the opportunity to start my own consulting company. And now I pretty much touch um, very, um, I have a heavy presence in the nonprofit space. So I do get to help kind of be in that element of helping people where where I had so much passion to do that, but I also get to do the fun things, which is to do really great business and, um, you know, um, execute on really beautiful design that makes sense for each brand. So that's kind of what I'm in now with my own company is doing a, a few different things. Heather, a few different things is an understatement. <laughs> I'm just going to put it that way, but you are just such an inspiration to me just having the chance to get to look through all your stuff and visit with you again before the show because you are operating out of what a lot of people don't ever get to and that is from their heart space to do things that inspire them that move them because they want to give back to the world but for you I, I really want to focus on the story of overcoming that you've had because your childhood was not growing up you're very public about your story and how you basically had to endure a childhood of not knowing what was going to happen for you and your family and that led to you being um, in a very very specific way growing up different than most other people and so I, I don't want to again take any of the details out I want you to if you would share your story about growing up the the tragedy that marked um, the change in your life and and how you turned that into triumph yeah absolutely so I mean in our case we were a big uh, family and we were at like the middle class tier. My dad was a senior test chief engineer at Boeing. He was in the Navy, so he was very resourceful, but we were, we were definitely, which I don't think a lot of people talk about is when you look like you were established from the outside, right? Your middle class level. But if there's one thing financially that goes wrong, you're this close from going to the streets. And so in my mother's case, you know, she obviously had which mental health is so different now that now that it than it was before. I feel like there was less rooms, less room for people. I think to understand what their what their issues were, like what their mental health uh, symptoms looked like, and that it wasn't who they were. They couldn't disassociate themselves from these traumatic reactions that they're having, which I think is what, you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not an expert, I've just been around a lot of them for pretty much my entire life. And in knowing my own personal story, there's a lot of, there's something to say when things are built up, if you don't have a release for it, it just manifests into all kinds of ugly things that we see every day, like addiction or domestic violence or whatever the case is, because we're operating out of like an unclear place within ourselves. And so I wanna make that very clear because as much as you know, I talk about my mom's mental health, I have absolute respect for her, so does my father. And we all were just very sad with, with how her life um, inevitably came out because she was a beautiful woman. And so with that being said, you know, she had her own upbringing that caused her to have issues and long term of having, you know, anger issues and, and bipolar disorder and, and abuse and all of that. You know, cancer did eventually happen. And when she went through the chemo process and everything, um, you know, she we thought it was gone and we were excited. And then it came back about a year later. And I think for me, because I'm the youngest of the six kids, all the rest of them were out of the house and during that period, you know, they were having their own issues to where I couldn't have anybody take care of me. And so that's when the therapist that they had been using for a long time suggested Sunshine Acres Children's Home, which is the home that I inevitably went to when I was 14 years old. Um, and basically what Ch Sunshine Acres Children's Home is, is it's not a group home. It's not foster care. This is actually a unique home really it's they're working on actually calling it by its name which is it's more of a family centric um way to care for kids there's different uh homes where there's about 10 kids like in each home and they were organized by you know girls and boys and then you had in this detached apartment to this home 
this kind of uh, apartment for where the house parents would stay at with if they had kids, their kids could stay there. And of course, everybody goes through background checks before they become house parents. And then you had like a relief house parent that pretty much watched you on the weekend. So it felt like family, it felt like grandparents coming on the weekend and then your regular parents with you. And, you know, they had some things where, you know, the house parents, they had very clear guidelines on how they were able to treat us. You know, they take, they took very good care of us to try and, you know, have 10 kids basically that are in trauma that are reacting and emotional, but they had a strong system with how they loved on kids and it was a Christian focused um, based home. And, you know, I'm an, I'm a philosophy honor student. Um, so religion for me it is an institution that I think is something to definitely be open to or discuss because it is a part of the pillars when it comes to how our society is constructed. Um, so um, basically that was sort of their, their care system to help us. And my mother passed away from the cancer when I was 17. And it kind of just was at that point when I found out about it, cause you know, I wasn't really, I wasn't really understanding where she was in the stage of her life. And so the stage of the life that she was in was where they were experimenting all these different treatments as they had been for you know, like six years already and nothing was working. And then I just remember my dad told me that one day she just kind of said, what if I don't want to try anymore? And my, you know, my father's a very, I get my, my force from my father a hundred percent. He is, was the most compassionate, loving, kind, uh, hardworking person that I know of that I've always been able to have and keep as a model. He told her, you know, I would keep trying, you know, like that he's always been. And and it was her choice that, you know, I'm, I'm here and, and I'm tired. And so it, we thought she would have a year. And so I remember she called me, of course, I was, you know, beside myself. And I thought I had a year and she passed away within a month. And wow. basically, I, my father, of course, was a wreck. And so I had to wait about a couple months because he wanted to get everything organized before I came home. So I think that's where my strength really comes from is the fact that I, all I wanted was my mother. And because of the way that it happened, inevitably, I had to really, at that moment, I died to myself at 17. I really wasn't didn't know who I was, everything that I had been driving for was now then gone. And I not only had to do that, but I had to stay somewhere where I wanted to be near my family and I didn't get to have that. So I think that's what is when people don't know who I am, they have to know that because when they feel my strength or they feel my force, you know, when I say that, I just, I am very organized, I'm very detailed and I make things happen. And that's not without having any kind of respect for the fact that you only get strength usually by building it. And it's usually by having such horrific things happen. And, you know, I had to, like I said, make a decision of how I want to live my life because I inevitably had a couple choices, right? When you think of childhood trauma, the, the risks that they have, they're getting teen pregnancy, they're getting into drugs, they're, you know, I had every reason to fail. And I, you know, truly, and many kids that I did grow up with, didn't go without hitting in some of those statistical drop, like little buckets, you know, they, they did drop in there. And so it was something where I had 70 kids on my mind, knowing their stories, knowing mine and realizing like, if I don't choose to live every day to go one way, I'm gonna fail. And it's been a process to keep going through that, but it's been a huge driver knowing that I do everything that I do because one day, which some people have already, you know, I think heard my story and it's helped them. But, you know, I have always been a dr driver to become the person that I was so desperately looking to see because especially with the modeling industry, there was nobody talking about being in a children's home. There was nobody talking about their traumas. And I mean, the grooming process in the modeling industry, you know, you're hypersexualized. So you're like 17, 20, getting attention from like, you know, 50 year old men. And it's just, it was a, it was a struggle. And I had to really find and learn and, and get the resources to force myself to stay on that straight and narrow because it was so quickly and readily there for me to drop on the other side. And you know, That's 
It's interesting to me, Heather, you, you've given us so much to think about right there because most of us, we grow up in the normal way, right? You, and you might be one parent, single parent family, two parents, and you know, a combination of all kinds of different ways. But most of us don't grow up like you did. And I was interested when I was reading through all your information, you, you did a lot of deep soul searching type writing that you make public yeah. on the website. And so as I read that, I was wondering how much of that is Heather now writing about Heather at 12, 13, 14, or how much of that was channeling what little Heather felt in those same emotions? Because I don't know that you could describe the, like obviously you put a lot of your heart and soul into those words. Um, and when you were talking about hiding around the corner and nice voices could turn mean in a moment and all that kind of thing, it, it took me emotionally on a, on a bit of a ride where I'm going, wow, you know, because I've recently experienced a loss in, in my family, very personal, deep tragedy. Um, and I can only imagine being a, a, this little girl looking, as you just said, for this love from your mother and knowing that she had medical condition upon medical condition and the simultaneous coalescence of those things is very challenging. When you, can you think back to how you were at that time before going to, you know, before you ended up going and, and hanging out with Sunshine Acres and getting that foundation, you know, what was, what was that like before? And that's part one. And then part two is, did, could your parents come visit you there? You, you talk about kind of weak parents and then weekend kind of grandparents. If you can just kind of wrap that up for me, I'm really intrigued yeah. by that. Of course. So the, you know, I believe, and just from my experience, like in understanding a healing journey, because I've technically feel like I've all, and, and you'll never fully feel healed. That's one of the biggest truths that once you get to the point where you thought you could just read everything and then you're like, I should be fine now and you're not, it's right there that I believe you start to really change your, your view of being like, oh, I'm always going to have to kind of feel this way and I'm always going to have to feel okay. So my writing style is a part of being analytical, being logical, but also allowing my words to almost be like paint on a canvas of just spewing out my my what's inside of me so what you're seeing is still a, a connection to that inner child that i'm still working on but i also firmly believe that if we could just show somebody what what healing what that language what that what that uh desperation looks like then people can kind of like take their own rope and get themselves out too because it's the how part is it's messy. And until you have something, I think, like me, which is a huge motivator, you're not going to you're not going to stay committed to fully getting on the other side of being OK to recognize you're always going to semi feel this way. You move that stuff out of your body by doing work that matters to you. So I also try and be 100% honest with myself, with my feelings, and with thoughts that might have come. And it wasn't, you know, I tied a lot of that writing together because I've had my writing, including all my college papers, all my professors, the, you know, the, the PhD individuals who read my papers. I went out and, you know, and I'm no longer, I, I've transitioned out of school now. So people know that because I, I realized I didn't need to go to school any further. And I hope people get that too, because that's always a weird thing. You don't need a college education, especially in this day and age like you used to. So if you're not feeling compelled to it, make that decision because I was going through depression, forcing myself to do something that I was like, no, I got all the experience. Now I need the accreditation. That's not the case. So a lot of my writing was a combination of literally a, at least a decade or so of my personal writings. I have my journals from when I was 14, like at the children's home. I have my college papers and I have my papers and writings I've written since then. So that's sort of what that writing nature was, is it's really just almost like poetry in my mind, because I'm just throwing out what I feel. And we need to get comfortable with putting that out there respectfully, 
but inspecting it and saying, what is this? Because if you start to then see where it's coming from, then you'll start to be able to draw the lines of being like, oh, here's this belief that made this belief stronger. And then you start to see that, oh my gosh, I have to change my whole mindset. I have to change my why, what I'm doing. So hopefully that explained that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the clarification on the grandparents thing. So technically, again, the home, and this is, I'm excited to talk about this because it really does make me happy because it was such great memories, but they have a huge uh, acreage. And then they have right now about seven different homes. They're trying to get to 10, um, but they have seven different homes. There was 10, you know, girls um, and 10 boys in each one of the homes. And then they had our house parents that lived, like I said, took care of us the Monday through Friday. And then the relief house parents who were just a staff that were part time, like that basically rotated to different homes and they would help cover for the house parents, if that makes sense. So they all kind yeah. of supported each other. Yeah, and um, could your and parents support. come visit you? Could you have vi yeah, friends so and... The, so the thing about the home at that time period is it's a huge liability to have that many children. And so they were trying to figure out, especially with the sensitivity of, I mean, we're all coming from, some of the kids were coming from gang and like family members that were in the gangs. And so it was very, I, I know they did the best that they could, but we had, you know, um, home visit once a month for a weekend where we went back to our homes if that was an option. And sometimes some kids would go some days and then other days they couldn't. And that was because, so they were mediating really trying to still have us in contact with the family, which I said, we, you know, we did. And then our holiday home visits, if you could go, were longer. And when I say if you could go, again, we have, I mean, kids that came from parents who were molesting them, parents who were in trailer parks on drugs, uh, families that were caught up in gang violence. And I lived with these kids, you know, and I and, 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 and sometimes your roommate would be there and then sometimes they'd be gone because of the nature of all these complications, right? And then you have Sunshine Acres sort of being in their space because they're not, a, they are, like I said, they're not a group home. They're not state or federal funded. They're their own thing. They're all private donation because of the story that the founder, if you know how they came up, the founder started it 70 years ago and she hustled. I mean, her, her name was Aunt Vera. She found a, a plot of land and all she'd been wanting for so long, they were like a pastor and reverend was a children's home. And they found finally a spot in the middle of the desert where they struck a well. And at first there was no water, which was devastating because they're like, we can't have a children's home here if there's no water. And then they said their prayers and then boom, a bunch of water happened and that well is wow. still there today. So it really wow. was, came out of a miracle and they had all kinds of stuff for that home happened, like, you know, the, they were running out, because this was a long time ago, they were running out of food, and then all of a sudden, like, a milk truck broke down in front of the home, and everybody had a bunch of things like that, like, you can, anybody can go and get a tour and learn some of these stories, because these are the stories that I've grown up on and have seen, like, firsthand of just, I mean, people just come to the home, because there really is so much love of how they started it, and how they, how they've organized their whole care. So, like I said, you understand that technically they were my, my legal guardian. So Sunshine Acres Children's Home, I had a case manager who helped me with all of my things at the children's home. Um, and so they, like I said, they had our, our legal guardian rights to make all the decisions. So when we saw our families, it was sort of like a visit and, you know, and the hopes was always that you could go back home. Some kids were there because they were troubled, um, you know, things like that. So. So it is a bit dynamic um, with with the question when you ask about how we saw our family still living. Gotcha. In. And and as you got older, I'm interested in the concept of how you transitioned into modeling because obviously um, with some of the stuff you had gone through and you were with at risk kids and in one way you were an at risk kid as yeah, far as 100%. yeah. So when you look at that, um, you know, modeling has been known for a long time to have some really good people that have some really bad things happen at the end of the day because of just the, the nature of how they, they can be exploited and mistreated and this kind of thing. What was, where did, where did the modeling start? Cause you're still kind of in the home environment, right? At Sunshine Acres, 
did someone see you and be like, oh man, you'd be a great model? Did you have interest? And then they had to approve it because like you say, they're the guardians. Take me on that, that trip. Yeah. So that actually is from my father. So when I came home at like at 17, eventually I came home. Um, and you were um, done from the home at that time or you yeah, were on a visit? So this was my mom passed away when I was 17 and then I had to wait two months and then my dad, cause I was 17, then I could drive myself. I could come back home and my dad was okay to have me home while he was working. Um, that was actually his, I had an idea that I wanted to do modeling, but at that time I was super insecure and I definitely was a late bloomer to where I felt more gangly and I just didn't have like a feminine energy at that. And I also didn't have a mom, so I didn't, I didn't have that innate part. So I also built into my femininity and my sexuality and all of that. But um, basically my dad knew my mom always loved modeling and always loved fashion. And it was actually him who wanted to basically get me some acting and or modeling classes and we chose acting because I felt like I could learn modeling myself and I did like improv classes um, and acting classes and then I started to go to some castings and then eventually as I kind of kept get like networking with like local photographers and they sort of I found a couple photographers that like really liked working with me and we would I would get portfolio work for my book and then they would get it for theirs. But I actually had my my modeling start by a man named Brian Higgins. I was at EVIT. There's a school out here called East Valley Institute of Technology. It's a uh, it's a trade school that you can do when you're in high school um, and you basically go to high school for half of the day and then you get to go to their the other half and at their school they had cosmetology uh firefighter massage therapy photography photoshop and it was me that chose to do cosmetology which i dropped out <laughs> i uh i eventually found out i didn't want to do hair um and then but but that was because when we did our hair fashion show like they used me as the model and i did like a little mohawk and then it was the uh photography students and the teacher that noticed that I was kind of natural because I was always looking at magazines growing up and I always had my walls lined with like Vogue and Elle like when I was like a really young girl. So I kind of had this innateness to it. Um, and basically they started to take me into their classes and do photography for the kids to test because I got approval from my teacher. And then towards the end of the year, and this was all my mom was like just passed away. So I'm like, you know, in school, I barely was there. Like I literally in high right. school, I was probably out 11 days out of the allowed seven because of just, I was, you can't imagine the loss of just, a, you didn't have a purpose. You're just an empty shell. You're like, why am I still living? Oh, I didn't know I could have like this much pain and still be here. So, so I was just kind of flowing. And then eventually I found that I had some, I had a light or I had a spark with photography and how I wanted to rise up and become something outside of myself. And then I told my teacher, like, listen, I'm not going to pass and, and make up these hours after graduate. Like, I want to do modeling. Will you let me start to go into these classes? And she knew everything that um, I was going through. So she kind of facilitated my part-time, you know, sneaky, not sneaking, but she approved for me to go do another class. And that was sort of where I met Brian Higgins. He used to be in New York and he was a Ford Robert Black, like model photographer at that time. So that's an agency that at that time knew how to do bookings and knew how to do a portfolio and all of that. And it was actually him and his wife took me, I think, to like Nordstrom and bought me like my first black Calvin Klein dress. Like they just really believed in me. And the funny thing is I, Brian Higgins um, wrote or read that article I recently uh, posted about your family couldn't take care of you. And he didn't even know about what was going on at that time. I said, I didn't want to tell you because I didn't want you to, I didn't want whatever was happening to stop. But it was them who really gave me that professional acumen. He told me how to do castings and wear black and how to dress and be polite and all these things because he was a photographer that technically hired models for jobs. So he was really the one that poured into me, took some additional portfolio photos that I had to where then other photographers were like, oh, okay, you can shoot. 
you want to shoot this and then that's sort of when you collaborate and then that's when like brands and all of that will come into it and make it bigger so that's kind of how my modeling actually really started do you have any advice for if you have young ladies or young men watching this that would be interested in doing the modeling experience would you tend to push someone in one direction or another would you say follow your passion just be careful here's some things to know because modeling can again it can be i'm sure an amazing experience and it can probably be pretty traumatic if if it doesn't go down correctly any thoughts on that well the way that modeling used to and i mean it, it still is being like used as far as like how you get into the industry as far as getting with the agencies to the castings this world with the internet now has just bombed that reality and bombed that world in my opinion you now are your brand and so people actually now come to you and you get to negotiate what you want to do so as long as now you create your own content for yourself to market yourself then you have a lot more negotiation whereas before you know when i was in greece shoot i was a brown hair brown eyed girl in a room with a lot more prettier brown hair brown eyed girls in my opinion and we were all trying on the same freaking bikini and the photographers just exploited us and we're like talking about our body parts and talking about this and that and so so now you have there's a different way of what's that word called i'm sorry i'm gonna space there's a different way of castings that i think is a lot more safer now and models have a lot more control now and you know you can really build your own brand and do any type of modeling that you'd like there's not just high fashion editorial there's commercial there's uh, lifestyle and and really commercial and lifestyle is just connecting with different businesses on what's the purpose of this photo shoot well if the purpose of the photo shoots to market the restaurant or the clothing or the city or the headshots for professionals for their websites like as long as you know exactly who the casting person is what they typically do i mean we really have to do our research more on the backgrounds of the people that we work with because you know i worked with some people and eventually found out they were not good at all and that's unfortunately you can't really um you cannot change that, but if you have a rigorous vetting process and you have these strong, clear boundaries, like I will not do this, or predators are, are, are um, they do not like strong, clear, logical people. You don't need to have a predator come anywhere near you because they know that if you're strong and you're clear, you're smart and they won't be able to take advantage of you and they'll go on to the next unfortunate person who they might be able to exploit. And like I said, you understand that the people who are easier to exploit are the ones that are vulnerable because they've gone through such things where, like in my case, my risk was, you know, that I had issues with, with abandonment and with trying to prove my worth and to do all of those things because of the fact that I was always trying to like do that with my mom. So being aware also of your issues will also safeguard you, not just on the front end of how you articulate or how you take people in, but how you're going to make every decision moving forward and also stand strong to be aware. All you have to do is be aware, ask questions, be clear and be polite and professional. And that's how you avoid predators. Nice. So what a great answer. And, and that goes well beyond modeling, Heather. That's I think, and that's for all of us to, to, it's a good rule of thumb to keep us safe, but also to help us be good people. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you went through your modeling career, you had success, you found these other passions and these other uh, things that you wanted to do. And so now taking us to this point in time, now you've given your life to a lot of things, one of which is the nonprofit space, like you mentioned, you have a, a heavy influence there. And you're doing that through a number of ways, whether it's through um, the marketing side of things to help bring awareness or help setting up fashion shows. I wanna get into a little bit about the connection between AZ Goods and the fashion show that you put on, the XCI Fashion Show. Can you kind of ramp that up? Tell us what AZ Goods is and then how this fashion show plays a huge role in that. So this is, my heart is what AZ Goods is because AZ Goods to me is kind of like this hub. I mean, it's not kind of, it is this hub of resources because 
typically, you know, retailers, they have like overstock or returned items um, that they get back from their customers. Most people might know or they might not know that typically it's so expensive for them to bring all those returns or overstock goods um, back into their retail flow. They actually so they throw them away into the landfills, or they were anyways. Yeah, and, and, and the number is huge, Heather, huge. I was blown away when I learned, I watched the clip you sent me. Isn't it something like two million pounds a month or some crazy thing that, go, that would go into landfills if they weren't taken somewhere? No, that's how much we keep out of landfills. It's actually a oh. lot more than that. So, oh, so wow. Yes. Yeah, so I'll explain all of this because technically this is called product philanthropy. Um, which I didn't, you know, it's a new term, but technically that's the best way to describe this is it's literally retailers and corporations that want to be, I don't want to do this, but socially responsible to where they're, instead of throwing these perfectly good items, some might have, and it's usually pretty rare, some might have like a missing screw or something like there's those one-offs because we get everything. Um, but for the most part, these are perfectly great items that our nonprofits can definitely use for the people that need it the most for their programs and whatever the needs are in the community. Um, but it's actually, yeah, our, our distribution center just in Arizona alone at Easy Goods, we move about 52 semi-trailers or we receive about 52 semi-trailers a month of all of these different items from Amazon, Walmart, Ikea, uh, Crate and Barrel, um, uh, Home Depot. We, we get a lot because of the relationship that they have with a larger national nonprofit who actually approached Sunshine Acres to set up an operation like AZ Goods. Um, so technically AZ Goods is a uh, distribution center for um, receiving donated goods that Good360 gives us. And then there we're kind of the connector to the nonprofits of saying, hey, we have literally this whole warehouse and what do you need for your programs? And so that's sort of why when I thought of Okay, Heather Lay, your job is to try and get pretty much as many nonprofits connected to AZ Goods, all of them really, um, to AZ Goods to try and have them know that we're here. So, in my background from like modeling growing up, I did a lot of, you know, nonprofit fashion events and fashion and art is a great way to bring people together. And so I collaborated with a, uh, a couple artists out here and said, I have this idea. What if we did a fashion show um, in the warehouse and bring people to have them see what's actually all this stuff in our warehouse? Because it's until people see it in person, it's hard to conceptualize it. So basically, I turned the warehouse into like this runway art show, which was really cool. And that's how I met Carrie was because that and all the ways of marketing, what I know for sure, and this is coming from somebody who's literally been in the hosting space, literally worked with people who make who made a lot more money than I did doing SEO and doing PPC and being developers and this and that. And there's no better way to build your business and keep it up, depending on the type of industry I should say that you are, than word of mouth and just doing great business. It's the one that keeps you around forever, pretty much, because you actually have to be held accountable if you're talking and having real personal conversations to people. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to have some of my few people that I was working with to talk about this sort of help me with the guest list. And so I wanted it to be free because that's one thing that I saw is that people will come together for a good cause. And I wanted to make a point that if we are more intentional with the way that we do our event planning and all of that, that more people can benefit and the right people will benefit from it. Again, that goes back to what the purpose of the event was. And what the purpose of the event was is I wanted to connect the community to understanding who AZ Goods was. And to me, the community is, you know, the businesses, the nonprofits, and the creatives in this circle of, of people that are gonna help have the most level of influence on society. And I say that because, you know, the businesses make the money for the community, the nonprofits help sort of do the community work. And again, it should be strategic and organized and how they do it. 
but nothing without the story being shared would be seen without the creatives with the video with the photos with the writing with the websites whatever it is i realize that it's like a trifecta and with that as long as we're all aligned on the same thing it can be extremely powerful so that's why i decided to do a fashion event and then it just kind of became then I realized I was doing a fashion event and I was like, well, why don't I do it how I want to do it? And so that's when so I, cool. So that's when I realized I was like, well, you know, I've been doing this freaking thing for like 10 years. And so I've done like LA Fashion Week. I've gone to so many art shows. I I had so much experience that when I just started to put it on paper, it just flew out of me. And then that's when I knew that I was like, you know what, we're going to do this to bring people to easy goods, but we're also going to highlight the nonprofits and the work that they do that people don't see day in and day out. We have the unique blessing and gift to be able to talk to these nonprofits because they come into our warehouse and they come grab the items. And so we're hearing constantly all of the stuff and we're we're sharing the stories like we're having support for each other because it's very draining and a lot of nonprofit owners are also the good one some of the, some of the ones that i've worked with are hustlers they're also business owners we work with um you know people who also have like their own their doctors they have their own private practice and so they're 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 committed individuals and i was like we need to show people seriously how that this world is real. And, you know, every one only thing in life is guaranteed. You're going to die and you're going to suffer. I know that sounds depressing, but ultimately when you get that down, then you get to start to look for all the beautiful things and all the good things that are that much more vivid, right? You feel what yes. sucks the hardest. Contrast. We call it contrast. Yes. I love that. Oh, I didn't even know you guys were talking about that. I, I was spitballing here, but like, you know, that's, I'm just feeling it from what I've known and how I've grown. And so that's why I was like, okay, I wanted to make it a surprise of how I was going to do the runway show. And I marketed it as, you know, that it's this fashion show. We're using recycled clothing. I mentioned we were going to highlight community issues, but I didn't say how. And Carrie will tell you because she, I actually found her through just a word of mouth and she was like, I need to talk to you. And then we called each other on the phone and we're, I just went, I was like, I was on like very like high energy. Cause I was also, I wanted it to happen and I wanted it to be done really well. And so I was just this neurotic person of being like, it's finally here. I'm going to, I'm going to tell everybody everything I know quickly. I only have this one chance. And so, so I told her everything about how I wanted to really highlight all of those five issues and she was like i was invited to go to maple and ash she's like but i want to go to this on my birthday so she came to my fashion show on my birthday which was i was like there's no better compliment than that first of all so i definitely had everybody sing her happy birthday at oh the that's nice so, oh yeah no i was uh I, I knew i was gonna do that but she brought Carrie brought, I would say, shoot, like 60%, 50%. She got a chunk of my guest list. And there was like 230 people at my event. And it was yeah. seven people that pretty much was like, hey, do you need to be here? I had a lot of different organizations, attorneys there, um, businesses there. There was even people from the FBI that went to my show because it was just like people were freaking excited to talk about the stuff that they work in that people don't want to talk about, you know, and I'm kind of the, the caveat where I talk about everything deep and, you know, I love to talk about beautiful light things, but I'm a person where I've been in the thick of it for so long that deeper stuff kind of soothes my soul more. I have a yeah. hard time with superficial things mostly um you know but i find a balance because i enjoy the little things in life but carrie was a big part of my my xai show so i'll all for the people who don't know um when we did our fashion show i created like a maze around our palettes which if you go to my youtube channel you'll see either my youtube channel on lay llc or my youtube channel on xci fashion show az or um, i think the az goods has it but I had the top five community issues and I had the models reenact sort of the type of issue that it was. So for the homelessness issue, I had a person from a long time ago, actually, his name is John Linton. He had a, a nonprofit. He still does. It's called I Have a Name Project. And he used to be a uh, worked with Ralph Lauren in New York and basically was living it up and had a great life, but then had to 
walk over a dead homeless body in New York and nobody cared. And I think that's actually what changed him. And then he started to go around downtown Phoenix and respectfully and offer like socks, a water bottle and, you know, something to the homeless person to see if he, if they would feel comfortable to share their story. And what a lot of them want to do is freaking share their story because no one talks to them. So he created this um, whole social media movement. It's called I Have a Name Project. And he took these beautiful street style photography images and then also literally wrote their story. No matter how gruesome, no matter how ugly that it was, he and I like went around together. Obviously, I couldn't go by myself. But um, I mean, there was homeless people who did a who I messed up a Rubik's cube and then he did it behind his back in like less than a minute. Like these are people who were normal, who who maybe had a health concern. Like I said, the middle class thing where one financial thing happens, a medical expense and you're on the streets. And if it was an addiction that got you there, it's going to be addiction that keeps you there. So I did the him i pretty much you know dressed him up to where it was kind of like you know not the nicest clothes and then he had a sign that went i have a name project and i had a statistic of the homelessness issue on projectors around the event so like it was this very kind of immersive thing and then the um the addiction girl she just looked like she was coked out she was awesome all she all she did was walk around kind of in, in, a, in a dress and was, you know, looking like she was, like I wanted people to see and feel the stuff again that they don't feel. And then the uh, domestic violence one um, was basically, I had the two models come out together. It was a man and a woman. And then the girl kind of walks off her by herself in the middle of the runway. And I had the guy go, hey! and then he basically, she stopped, froze. And then he like charges after her to the middle of the runway. And I told and we kind of came up to where she's going to be like tired of it and angry of him always like controlling her. And then he pretty much tries to grab her and he rips off her jacket and she throws her jacket back to him and they both storm off. And the thing was, is I did a wrap around. So there was four different rows. that got a private show of this and it was only one issue at a time. And then the human trafficking one was the girl pretty much was um like had a black eye had a stab wound and there was like this entity or this thing that was the reason that was kept drawing her back into such a horrible industry of human trafficking and we wrote stuff like he says he loves me on the jacket and all these things because women can love their pimps essentially is a huge part of people don't know well why is she in there well because many different reasons why she's still in human trafficking you don't know what that is so that was the human trafficking and then the children's issue last minute i was like i can't think of anything that's respectful to do for a children's issue so then that's when i did my story and i don't know if you saw that video where i had the i love sunshine acres children's yes. 17 that was actually the close out video of the show and mm. then basically brian um was the his rvp and pretty much my right hand and everything did a speech and then we had two other speakers and then the show was done. Um, and wow. it was, it was really, really, really important for me that I, I also use this, um, time to share what each model did because, you know, it's, it's it, in, in my world and how long it's been until people feel something, they're never going to change. And so, you know, I, the call to action for me too was also like let's do better creative work guys like let's do more meaningful things with with the way that we use our skill sets and that was a big vision for me with 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 the fashion show was i don't know how and why so many people just kept finding the name and the show and pe i just everything fell into place and it was because we had a mission we had a vision and if you build it they will come right hopefully if you're building something good for the right reasons but that was totally the case with the xci fashion show oh what a great story and i know you know you've been so generous with your time i want to as we kind of circle this whole thing together can you share with the audience Number one, because your passion has come through, the projects have come through, and you're doing a lot more stuff as well. Is the fashion show something that um, is an annual thing, number one? And number two, if people want to learn more about AZ Goods, about getting involved with you or the, the groups that you're with, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so, um, so the fashion show is 
really tough because like I said, it was there was no budget and there was no ticket. So I've had lots of people ask me if I'm going to do it again uh, this next year, and it's just to be decided right now. Um, so possibly, but like I said, that was for a purpose. Um, yeah. And so I'm not sure if I want to, if you can do something like that again, I'm not a big fan of doing that. Um, I might do something different and bigger, who knows, but probably not. Um, and then if anybody wants to find out about me just go to lay llc.com because i have and will you spell lay make sure that they yeah. it's not like it sounds it's not l-a-y exactly. i was just gonna do that because my whole life <laughs> trust me i know how people spell it so it's l-e-i-h it's german but it's pronounced dutch but it's lay l-e-i-h-l-l-c.com and if you go to my projects page i actually have links to all of my projects i'm working on including easy goods um, including the XCI fashion show, because I do still have that website up with all the photos and everything. Um, and then my other business with like the, the laundry room lockers with the app and dry cleaning and all of that. So that's all on my website. That's beautiful. What, what would you say to someone if, um, they were to ask you how to, how to follow in your footsteps with respect to giving back to the, to the world in some way, any, any advice on that? I would say not, don't follow my footsteps. I would say ground into your story and dig deep and find what is the issue or what is the thing that just gets you out of bed because there's steps before you can actually self-actualize to get where I'm at and wherever you're at, just start where you're at and ground into, it's usually the things that you take for granted that make you happy and you're like, no, 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 I'm not, It'll come back to you and you'll you'll be like, OK, I guess I'm supposed to do this. So just ground into your story where you're at. Start to uproot the toxic things in your life, like the friends or the people, because you will never self actualize if you're binded by a bad group or a bad way of people. And that's what I said on another podcast that I was on. I think it was called uh, I forgot what the name was, but I but I made sure that before you can go and be and become, don't look at my story. It's gonna confuse you, focus on your own. Because I looked at everybody else's story with that same advice and it it gave me issues because it, you'll never match up to somebody else. Your design is from your grounded self. And we all have such a beautiful story, right? So yes. in, in every beautiful story, there's tragedy, there's comedy, all of the elements of any great story are in all of our great stories. and. Heather, you have been a delightful guest. Your story is wonderful and it's just so early. You're still such a baby in everything. Uh -huh. So you've done so much and you've been a great guest. Just know that we at Ramos Law, and by the way, the person Carrie that she kept referring to, that Heather was referring to is Carrie Ramos, our, uh, one of our prime, prime people at Ramos Law and, and super instrumental in our, in, our, um, in our firm down in Arizona, just a wonderful person. And, and all of us have this story. You've been a great guest. And, all of us at Ramos are big supporters of, your, of yours, Heather. So please keep doing what you're doing and magnify it. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope that anything that anybody has any other questions on can, I'm super friendly. Um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, you can go through layllc.com and I'm looking forward to hearing anybody's feedback of how they thought of this. That sounds great. We'll do that. If you do have feedback for Heather, please reach out to her. And if you have enjoyed this, were inspired by this, any part of it, we had several different parts. We explored a lot of things today. Please share it, share the video, share the podcast, get the word out. Let's make sure that people know that people are doing good things. And until next time, keep making a difference. Awesome.